All right. Thank you for sitting down for an interview. Um, why don't we start with what's your name and what are you currently working on? Uh, my name is Sebastian Kenzie and I work on Babel, um, which is a JavaScript compiler. So um, maybe uh, you could give us a, a brief history of, of Babel and how you started working on it and, and sort of what uh, you know inspired you to build it. Um, yeah, so I built it when I was finishing school. Um, I realized there was a lot I didn't know about compilers and parsers um, and more of the computer science side of things. Um, and I also knew about a thing called ES6 um, and I decided to like make a thing that would convert between the two. Um, and since then it's kind of, it, it then changed from the, the, at the time it was called six to five, um, now to Babel. Um, and it's become a more generic JavaScript compiler that just transforms JavaScript. I think that was the uh, starting point for CoffeeScript as well, that uh, the creator wanted to learn more about language design and it was sort of like a, a learning project that became something that was really fundamental to the way a lot of people work. Um, maybe you can, uh, like there's a huge interest in transpilers and it, it you know, the, the web, JavaScript's moving in that direction. How is Babel, how does it compare to Traceur and, uh, you know, TypeScript also has a transpiler, but uh, Traceur is the one that a lot of people are familiar with. Maybe you could tell us how Babel is different and, and sort of where it's going. Yeah, so the biggest difference is probably, I guess, how it was marketed. Um, so Babel has always been like pushed as like a production thing that you should use. Um, why Traceor has always been like, like just a thing Google uses. Like um, the documentation, like it's kind of difficult to use. Um, and so one of the things that uh, Babel prides itself with is how easy it is to use. Um, and it, probably the largest differentiator would be um, just in the approach to certain things like um, Babel is quite customizable. It has a lot of plugins. Um, so you can hook into any part of Babel and um, add your own transformations while stuff like TypeScript and Tracer, you can't. Um, it's not an out-of-the-box solution for um, JavaScript transformation where that's more Babel uh, tries to be. That sounds really exciting. So is there like an ecosystem building up around Babel with other ways of plugins and, and things like that? Yeah, definitely. So um, stuff like uh, minification um, or code optimization. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of kind of transformations you can apply to your code to make you more productive or make your code faster, um, easier to debug. Um, you could do automatic profiling or benchmarking. Um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of power in this kind of framework or platform. I know with a, a lot of transpilers, people have been traditionally maybe a little bit afraid of, of debugging transpiled code. Maybe you could talk a little bit about how uh, Babel sort of deals with that and sort of, you know, how that impacts or doesn't impact developers using it. Yeah, so that's actually a, another big thing that um, differentiates Babel, how it's much easier to debug the code that's output um, versus other transpilers. Um, it uses a lot of heuristics and static analysis to simplify the output code as much as possible. Um, it has a side effect of also being more performant and um, being much more readable in case you have to debug something. Uh, there's also first class uh, source map support. So if you're using source maps, then you can just um, use those and your original code will be referenced. But if you're in an environment that doesn't support source maps, then the output code is very readable with um, new lines retained in indentation, uh, all the exact same from your original input code. Um, with, with JavaScript moving so fast and new libraries and new approaches coming out, um, some of those would be interesting to sort of merge into to Babel. With the, the modularity, um, can I add my own sort of pet features to JavaScript and then use Babel to, uh, to sort of transpile them? Yeah, so are you talking about stuff like syntax extensions? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's not currently implemented, but that's definitely like where it's going to go. Because um, there's currently there's some future JavaScript proposals that are currently in Babel. Um, the likelihood of them all being uh, actually included in the specification, uh, like it's unsure. Um, and people may want to continue using those features. It's not that they're not stable or um, something like that, but if you want to continue using them in the future, then you're, you're going to need to have like a plugin ecosystem where you can customize the syntax. Um, 
you have the downsides of it not being spec compliant, but if it makes you more productive or um, happier as a developer, then there's like no real reason why you shouldn't kind of do that sort of thing. With um, JavaScript almost moving to becoming a, a almost like a virtual machine, like you know, ignoring bytecode, but all the transpiling going on, uh, people are building new languages and experimenting with languages. In the future, will Babel be maybe a platform that someone could build their own language on top of as a uh, an experiment or their own learning? Oh. Yeah, so I guess that's where uh, syntax extensions come in more. Where um, I don't see it being something that you use to build completely new languages, but JavaScript derivatives. Um, I definitely see it being uh, like a base for that or even languages that just compile to JavaScript. Um, like there's a, a couple of experimental languages that actually compile to ES6 and then hand that off to Babel to transform down. Um, so it makes it much easier for the language designers since they don't have to worry about how do I turn this feature into ES5 that anybody can use. Instead, they just turn it into ES6 and then just pass it off to Babel. Um, I, I know, uh, I assume your talk was on Babel, but maybe you can give a, an overview of what your talk covered um, for people who haven't seen it yet who want to go see it on YouTube. Um, yeah, so I just went over um, what Babel is, uh, how it works, the current abilities of it, and what it'll potentially be able to do in the future once more development has gone into it, and how why the ecosystem can benefit from um, something like this. So in doing this, it's a, you know, obviously a very interesting project. It's been very successful. Um, what is the, the most interesting insight you've gained about software development as a profession from uh, working on Babel? Um, this probably isn't so much as software. Like The main insight that I've actually gotten probably isn't related to like the actual software, but more um, the community in open source. Um, just like managing that is very difficult. Um, and especially uh, trying to get more collaborators on the actual project um, I and mean, sharing the workload has definitely been a challenge. Um, so yeah, dealing with the community has been probably the biggest one. And a little bit earlier, you spoke to sort of how it's marketed or how it just sort of fits in the perception of the community. Um, do you have any sort of recommendations for people who are starting their own open source projects from both you know, how they, they position it with the community and, and also build teams of collaborators? Yeah, so I guess making it seem professional, even if it's not, like if it's just you working on it, um, like a, a decent website and, and documentation really helps in the perception of your open source project. Um, and especially stuff like um, having like logos of companies who are actually using it really helps build confidence in people who are deciding to use it. Uh, since if they know these companies are relying on it and using it, it's much more... Um, it's much easier for them to convince like their bosses or whoever is whoever's involved in the process of uh, deciding to use it um, that is the right path to go down since if these companies use it then uh, it's most likely reliable and stable and you can rely on it too. Great. So uh, one final question. Um, what do you see in the future of JavaScript um, you know, specifically in the next couple of years say? Uh Probably m like more experimentation with the language itself, um, stuff like syntax, um, and finding a balance between going to overboard. Um, we're currently in a phase where there's a lot of new syntax and people are kind of jumping in headfirst and using it um, excessively without kind of understanding the consequences. Um, stuff like readability and performance that I think will normalize over time as, mi as people become more conservative in their usage. All right. Well, thank you very much.